Well, I'm, I'm going to start with a life science development that I've heard about and I actually had the, the pleasure of visiting a company here, a small startup in Glasgow and it's, it's bacteriophages or just they're sometimes called just phages and phages are tiny virus viruses that attack bacteria and phages have been doing this for you know as long as there has been life on the planet they are a very simple organism the virus will go in can deal with different bacteria and you can target a phage for a particular bacteria now when we're talking about things like antimicrobial resistance and overuse of antibiotics uh, if we can start looking at other technologies that could prove useful in the future for tackling uh, bacterial infections then uh, this is something that that really we need to be taken incredibly seriously there is an awful lot of money spent on prescribing and repeating prescriptions of antibiotics that are not having the impact they have and of course we've got the rise of superbugs as well so so anything we can do so that i think is really exciting and i'm kind of looking forward to seeing what developments there are in that area over the next the next few years um probably more engineering wise uh the space industry here in the uk is incredibly exciting i know we've we had uh, the launch people are talking about the failed launch uh, from cornwall it wasn't a failed launch it was a successful launch most of it was successful until the final firing of the rocket um you know it's disappointing but actually still very exciting what's happening with the, the space industry and um here in scotland we we get the saxon board space or hoping to have a vertical launch sometime in 2023 as well. Maybe by the time of the, the conference, we might have seen that happening. So so that's that's incredibly exciting as well. And there's, I mean, as a physics teacher with 20 years experience in teaching physics, we used to talk about the space industry in Florida and in, um, in Houston and all of, we'd never have thought about talking about the space industry in Glasgow. Yet here we are in Glasgow with an, a thriving space industry now. So, so that's incredibly exciting. But the last thing probably I want to talk about is um, some of the advances in photonics. There's so many advances in photonics, but one that I think is, is particularly interesting is the use of LiDAR, both in things like autonomous vehicles, which is going to, I think, be transformative, transformative, sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of how we how we operate and i look at for example my own parents who are no longer able to drive so i look at them and an autonomous vehicle might give them more independence so i think that's fabulous these kind of advances but also the use of lidar in um when we combine it with for example uh the renewable sector wind turbines and the use of LiDAR to fine tune both the direction that a wind turbine sits and the angle of the blades in order to capture the uh, the wind as, a, as well as possibly can. Now, tiny improvements in the percentage of, of wind capture that happen are going to make massive changes in terms of our um, ability to deliver renewable renewable energy. So that I think all these little changes are really, really important. And I don't think people would automatically relate photonics to climate change, um, particularly in looking at wind turbines, but it's incredible to see that happening. It, it, for me, it was, it was very straightforward. It was the independence referendum that was in 2014. I was campaigning for yes to independence. Um, we didn't win the vote. And after that, I decided that I had to get more involved in politics. At that point, I was a campaigner and I decided I was going to combine both my politics and my background in education. And I saw myself doing more sort of political education type work. Yeah, things have a, a funny way of working themselves out and round about that point the SM SMP had said they wanted at least one woman to stand as in the selection process in each seat and there was no women standing in my seat with a number of men but no women. So um, 
I, I tried to get many different women to put their name forward and I heard very similar things from them all. You know, we've, I've got children, I can't do it. It's not something that would interest me. I'm not good enough, all of these things. Some of them asked me the same question and I gave the same answers back. And it came to the 11th hour, we still didn't have someone um, to stand in our area. And what would have happened would have been, a woman would have been brought in from a different area and I didn't want that to happen. So very much at the 11th hour, I put my name into the selection process and um, and won. So so it was a bit of a, an accidental journey into politics. I certainly had no ambitions to be an MP. I often used to joke that anyone that wants to be a politician should automatically be barred from from the process. Um, so uh, very much an accidental journey into politics for me. And um, yeah, here I am seven years later, still in it. Oh, an incredible culture shock. And um, when I, on the day of the election, when I won this constituency, Glasgow Northwest, I walked off the stage and you'll see the stage on, on telly and I walked off the stage and um, there was a gentleman standing there who handed me an envelope and said, welcome to Westminster, ma'am. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? So that was an absolute culture shock. I'd never been in Westminster. I'd never even been in the Scottish Parliament at that point, although I was a local campaigner um, and very political. I hadn't, I hadn't been to a parliament and I found myself elected as an MP. So yeah, it, it was an utter culture shock. In terms of skills that are used in, in both, I would say, first of all, um, people skills. People skills are really important. Understanding people, understanding what makes them tick. It runs through everything in both politics and education. So that's that's been really important for me and it's been, it's been useful for me whenever I'm meeting with people. I would say probably more though, or, or along with that, um, Analytical skills are really important as a teacher, and particularly a science teacher, you're training people to be analytical, to consider evidence, to look at results, to work things out from that. And certainly in politics, we should see that been used. We can argue whether it is used properly or whether analytical skills are used properly in politics, but certainly I've found that useful for me in many areas. And particularly in my work in science and technology committee, but in other aspects of politics as well, we're using data all the time. It is, it's incredibly um, important to the work I do. Firstly, I would say there's clearly a shortage in of these types of skills. There's a shortage of people that want to go into these um, professions and these areas. I mean, I meet with companies regularly who talk about their plans for expansion, but talk about the difficulty in managing to recruit the right people. Here in Glasgow, we've got a huge strength in the photonics area, and we've got um, both Glasgow and Strathclyde universities doing incredible work in photonics. Um, so there are graduates coming through with the skills, but probably, probably we could um, double it and still use them. Um, so yes, there's definitely definitely an issue. Um, I do sometimes, and putting on my, my old teacher's hat, I do get a bit frustrated when I hear people talking about what should education be doing differently. And I, I know certainly as a teacher that, you know, you're, you're working away, you're delivering these courses, you're enthusing young people, they're loving what they're doing, and yet they go and study, for example, law, medicine, dentistry they're not going into um, professions like engineering or, or photonics. Um, it is a frustration of mine um, because I don't think the issue is with education. I think the issue is wider society. I think it's about people's understanding of what engineering is. There's still, I mean, here we are in Glasgow, I'm, I'm probably less than a quarter of a mile from the shipyards where I'm sitting just now. and. When we talk about engineering in Glasgow, we talk we think people think about people hammering bits of bits of steel. Um, there is still a lack of understanding of what that is, and I think industry has a lot of work still to do in that. Um, one of the things I always raise whenever I'm meeting with companies, engineering or or photonics or quantum or space companies, 
in Glasgow and across the UK actually is I say how are you advertising yourself and they'll say well go, we go into schools or we have open days or we have STEM ambassadors these are all great things these are all brilliant but we know the single biggest person that has the biggest influence on a young person's decisions to to go into a particular profession is their parents so that is the biggest influencer so if we're not reaching out to parents, if we're not letting parents know that there are jobs here, that are well-paid jobs here, that is a good career here, we need, um, if you're a young person, if your son or daughter trains in this area, you know, they can, they can actually have a fulfilling career. If that message isn't getting through to parents, we're going to keep seeing the medicine, the law, the accountancy, the dentistry, these types of, of degrees, rather than, for example, um, photonics and engineering. Undoubtedly, yes, but it's, do people from STEM backgrounds want to work in government? And if not, why not? I mean, I think there's, and it probably politics also has a particular, presents itself in a particular way and people have set ideas of what politics is. And unless, more people from more diverse backgrounds enter politics, that's not going to change. I mean, we know um, across, if we look at the breakdown of kind of backgrounds in in the Commons and uh, just in MPs, before we talk about civil servants, for example, if we look at MPs, very few of them have science backgrounds, lots have a law background, lots have, uh, have done um, PPE, um, usually at Oxford or Cambridge, that's not a reflection of society. They're not going to have the experience and knowledge of different sectors that would be useful. So diversity is really important. But I've got to say, looking at politics, pe I'm sure lots of people look at politics and look at what's going on and think, why would I put myself out there? Why would I put myself there to be kind of fed to the wolves? For one, if you look at the way the press will treat politicians, because yeah, that like everything, there are going to be some politicians that are probably in it for very selfish reasons. But there's also the majority of people in Parliament that act have actually gone in for, I suppose, wanting to make improvements to their local community. I would say that's what drives most people to enter politics. That's not how it's reported and that's not how politicians are reported. So I think probably the press have something to do with this. But I think also there, are, there is an, an element of politicians will, a scientist or an engineer will, will look at data, will look at evidence and will come up with solutions, ideas, conclusions based on that. I'm not sure that's done as well in politics as it should be. So maybe it's not as attractive to people from STEM backgrounds as it should be for those reasons. Uh, this one is probably a, a very a very easy question, and it's I'm sure the same as everybody else. It's meeting people in person. I don't think any of us valued how important it is to have face to face interactions and discussions. Um, until we couldn't do it. And then it was a thing that I started craving and I know many people started craving. It's great having meetings on Zoom or by Teams. These are, it's great technology and it has allowed interactions with people from all over the world. That's, the, there's definite benefits, but it is still quite an unnatural uh, situation. We don't speak as openly and as freely and as naturally as we would on a one-to-one. -one. And so I think there is there is absolutely no substitute for actually meeting in person, having these conversations, having the wee side jokes, hearing somebody over there say something, somebody shout something from somewhere else. You don't get that in Zoom. And that's really what's, what's going to be really important to me.